Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Three, two, one, and we're back, Julie. It is April the 15th. Dum, dum, dum. Mm-hmm. Tax it's day. day. Or, everybody's on top of it. Or in the real estate industry, it's officially called the tax extension filing day. Extension day. day. <laughs> extension day. <laughs> Which, by the way, unless the law has changed, I believe you actually can get an extension through October the 15th. Correct. Yeah. As far as I know, yeah. Right. So just maybe want to keep that one in mind. But the point is, do something today. Don't just do nothing about it. Yeah, they don't like it if you do nothing. They so do like something, it. right. So file an extension at the very least. But... Off to to greener pastures, and let's talk about something that will helpfully motivate you guys. Obviously, we're dealing with a huge national, and let's just call it what it is, uh, shortage of inventory of homes for sale. Everyone's talking about this. This is not new information. Um, And we've talked about why this is happening. You know, Julie and I have been drilling down probably for the last 18 months, um, explaining to you what was going on. A lot of people thought it was just interest rates. It's not just interest rates. We're going to talk about specifically why. Um, there is going to be a, a shortage of inventory for quite some time to come, which hopefully will throw more logs on the uh, you know, motivational fire for you guys to pivot and become listing agents. If you thought it was frustrating being a buyer's agent last year, just wait until this year. It's going to be far more frustrating. And from what we can tell, there's going to be no change in that, um, in that particular uh, market shift. So as you're going through these points, and hopefully you're writing these down, when you're thinking about them, you're also keeping in mind that you can um, make the most of the market that the market, the opportunity the market has given you. That's the thing you got to keep in mind. In real estate, there's always going to be up markets, down markets, buyers markets, sellers markets. There's going to be distressed markets. There's all going to be kinds of different markets. You just need to condition your brain and your skill set so that you can actually be successful in any market because you can be successful in any market. There, each market and each sort of market gyration does require a different approach, but you can adapt. You can change. Don't just be one of these agents that only can be successful in one particular market. That's right. And this podcast podcast series is specifically for all of you guys who are still struggling with this. There are three parts to this uh, podcast series. The first one has to do with your mindset, how you're talking to yourself about it, how you're talking to your prospects and your clients about this kind of market. The second part is how you're going to create more listings for yourself. And the third part is objection handling when you're going after those listings. The thing that you guys all live in fear of is, well, I would sell, but where am I going to move? So we're going to address how to actually deal with With that objection, remember an objection is an unanswered question in the mind of your prospect. So I've I've had a lot of them say, I'm not prospecting because I don't want to deal with another buyer, which goes to the, what I named this podcast series. Are you part of the inventory shortage? Become the cure. If you're not reaching out and you're not creating inventory, you actually are making it worse. So here, so. obviously, we're no, we know the topic is to not just explain to you why there's a, a market shortage of inventory, uh, and which is important that you know how to explain it to your prospective clients, right? So Julie's going to get into a little bit of the details uh, about that. But also, you need to understand, again, what you can be doing about it. So this is That's the right. practical tactical from several approaches. So get ready to take notes. All right, perfect. So let's start with two facts. Fact number one, inventory of available homes for sale is indeed at an all-time low. Year over year, active listings have decreased 20 to 40% depending on your city. And remember, we were already kind of low on inventory before that happened. Fact number two, there is very little cause to believe that this will change anytime soon. I'm tired of hearing agents say, well, we'll just wait until there's more inventory. Right. And there's a lot of hypesters that have basically come online, especially this year, trying to convince agents that there's some sort of looming housing crash. There might be a losing a looming housing crash like 20 years from now, but there sure as heck isn't one for the next three to five years. That counts as looming. And again, as we're going through these points, if you want to argue these points in your head or with other you know, real estate prognosticators, you can you know go Thank right you. ahead. But at least keep this information in mind because ultimately what it's going to do is give you the practical, tactical approach to being of service to others and make money no matter what direction the market's going. So why is the market, why is there such a massive shortage of inventory? Point number one, Julie. Yes, and these are points for you to understand, but also keep these handy because you are having buyers ask you, why shouldn't I wait? Okay, so why is this not going to change anytime soon? Number one, demographic demand. We've talked about that on previous podcasts, the sheer number of people 
who want to buy houses now. Now let's ex let's explain to them what that yeah. means. We can't assume they know. Sure. So essentially you have an absolute enormous number of people in all different ages that are essentially going to be in the housing market um, with lots of motivation. And uh, that's, we'll just go up from the bottom. You have the, uh, you know, Generation Z. They're just starting to uh, go into the family formation or, you know, buying their first home phase. Then you have the millennials. The millennials are, there's more millennials than there are baby boomers, which a lot of people don't understand. And the millennials are all in that, uh, you know, buying your first or even second house phase. Some of them are in their uh, mid to late thirties now. And so they've moved up. Some of them have been successful and they moved up the housing food chain relatively quick. The point being is there are tons and tons of millennials that are looking for homes. And then you have generation X, which is really nice generation, which many of you are as well, which frankly, uh, generation X is now at their peak earning and spending years. Most people don't earn the most amount of money until they're really about in their mid 40s all the way up to about the early 60s but the peak income for most people is in their 50s and that's also when they spend most of the money because most people unlike Julie and I when they're in their 50s don't have kids at home and so they start earning peak income um, the kids are out of college and they start blowing that money on all kinds of different things and that's just a typical life cycle cycle it's very predictable and it's not just for wealthy or well-off people this is true for everyone in every demographic right more cash flow they're still working they're still earning they're probably at the peak of their careers and they're definitely going to spend it. Um, and then you have, of course, the baby boomers. The baby boomers are, everyone likes to talk about the baby boomers, but the reality of it is, is in this, uh, essentially what's going on now, the millennials are sort of carrying the ball down the field. Baby boomers, the, there's three waves of baby boomers, demographically speaking. And if you guys want to read more about this, um, there's a book that was uh, written by Harry S. Dent called The Roaring 2000s. And there was another one called The Great Boom Ahead, I think it was called. Um, anyway, Harry S. Dent, he actually lives here in Puerto Rico. He talks about the influence of uh, demographics that's always underplayed when uh, economists like to talk about interest rates and market, you know, this is and the other things. But what Harry's uh, stance is, and we've been reading Harry's books since the 90s, is that the demographics are the ultimate um, determinant of what's going to be happening in housing and in the economy on a whole. And, you know, we can talk forever about that because it's a very interesting subject. I might even try to get Harry on our podcast. That'd be good. Yeah, I bet I could, actually. But it, it boils down to supply and demand. There's a ton of demand. Do you know he lives, yeah. did I tell you where he lives? Huh. He lives off one of the, he lives not on Puerto Rico, but an island off Puerto oh, Rico. Really? Yeah. That's awesome. That's how isolated he wants to be. Wow. I know. Well, he can still be on the podcast. Right. So, so don't underplay demographics. And so when people say, and again, Julie's going to get to this point, and I don't want to step on it too much. Uh, but when uh, we talk about, a lot of people will say, if interest rates go up, the housing market's going to crash. The housing market is 100% determined on interest rates. Well, we're going to tell you in a second why that's not true. Point number two, Julie. Yes, point number two. And I think this is really interesting because a lot of agents are saying, well, what's wrong with the builders? Why aren't they just building more? Well, builders can't keep up. Why is that? The cost of materials has tripled for lumber, increased 22% for steel, and many manufacturers are behind on shipping critical components. From toilets to refrigerators, creation and delivery of those items are behind. Even paint is hard to get. Nationwide, the average cost to build a house is up $24,000 on average. During the pandemic, many of the lumber producers dropped to 50% produ production in anticipation of the housing slowdown that never happened. And we're playing catch up with that. They literally, I mean, they cannot build it fast enough. So here's the thing that the carryover ramifications of the point Julie just made. Um, so if building supplies have gone up that much, so no, normally you could, uh, like if you were selling a normal meat and potato house, a normal meat and potato town, like where Julie and I sold real estate, and let's say the average sale price was $350,000, and let's say a new construction home, all new everything would be $400,000 or 375 or somewhere in there, nine times out of 10, I mean, honestly, it could even be more. It could be more like by maybe even 75, 100 grand. Nine times out of 10, that buyer is going to choose to go the new home route versus the resale home route because everything's new. And you could easily drop in $100,000 in replacing windows and air conditionings and all sorts of things on an older home. You know, we can argue about the, you know, location, all that, but don't get your mind clouded on that. The point being is that nowadays the price differential between a new construction home and a resale home, it's the, the gap is closing because new construction has gotten so uh, scarce and it's so expensive. What's happened, it's brought the resale values up. Typically resales in most markets would be in the shadows of new construction. If you had a nice resale community and then there was a new construction area that was nearby, the new construction area would suck the life out of the resale area because most people want the new construction. But now because there's not enough new construction, what's happening is the resale has increased in uh, cost that much faster. Um, and then when new construction does come online, the big, there's not a big price to, uh, differential. So that's something that's kind of a, 
an anomaly of this market. Now, a lot of people believe, and again, I don't want to step on Julia's point number four, but a lot of people believe that that's just essentially a COVID-induced thing, but that's not really true. That lack of new construction has been going on for over 10 years, and it's probably not going to change anytime soon. I've been hearing stories, maybe you guys have even had these stories to tell from your own experiences of uh, new construction. Well, I'll tell you one. I didn't tell you this. Mm -hmm. Who was it that told me this yesterday? Uh, Brandon Jackson, mm -hmm. and um, he's still somewhere in North Carolina. Charlotte. Charlotte, I think, yeah. So he told me there was a new construction builder in like a five to six hundreds price range mm -hmm. that put that was uh, putting some lots for sale, mm -hmm. and people camped out overnight to be first in line to get the lots to build a house. Yeah, even, camped even out the lots are competitive for for a lot. Yeah, like I'm when, hearing that from uh, Faith Makita in Boise, Idaho, to, as well. Think about that. I mean, it's crazy, and the some of the other builders have uh, two and three hundred people deep waiting lists. Yep, and I've heard you've heard so, we've yeah. experienced stories of people on resale homes doing open houses and like. Like the open house starts at one o'clock and then there's a line of 50, 75 yeah. people. Another one of my clients mm -hmm. yesterday or maybe the day before told me that exact scenario, put a house for sale. Um, and this wasn't their listing. They were telling me about this experience that there was a hundred people, something like that. Wow. They were in line to go in the open house and they received 42 offers. It's incredible. It is incredible. But, but to your point, that's what, you know, supply and demand being offset looks like that's compare the demand. 42 offers to one house for sale. And so agents will say, well, or maybe interest rates do go up. Maybe we do have a little bit more inventory. Well, there's still, you know, 41 people left to buy that stuff. So, I'm going to edit yeah. your point number three. Point That's number okay. three, real estate and all assets are seen as an, in, an inflation hedge. What does that mean? It means that there's a lot of people, a lot of um, you know investors and other folks, but a lot of people are being uh, told by their investment advisors and just know from previous experiences that when there's a potential onslaught of inflation on the horizon, the best thing to do is put your money into assets. So assets, for example, if you don't believe that the you know $1,000 you have in the bank is going to buy you what $1,000 will buy you today. In other words, if you think like you want to go out and buy a TV for $1,000, and so you've got the money in the bank and then you go and you know, like, you know, Costco's got it for sale for $1,000. And then tomorrow you go to Costco and they want $1,100 for that TV. Well, I mean, that's sort of an inflationary issue where, and that can absolutely happen. So the cost of the, um, you know, essentially the cost of the TV went up, but what really happened is the buying power of your dollars went down. And what a lot of people do when they're fearful of that happening is they'll buy hard assets that they believe at the very least will hold value. So you're going to see massive inflation or call it whatever the hell you want to. If you want to call it inflation or appreciation, you can, but it really is inflation. You're going to see massive inflation because people are buying real estate as inflation hedges uh, in all assets, not just real estate. I'm talking everything, cars, art, wine, um, this is not new information for the well healed. There's been many, many uh, financial reports coming out that are suggesting that um, people that use private financial advisors absolutely positively start diversifying into hard assets. And those articles started in earnest probably about 18 months ago. Um, there are lots of little interesting indexes that you can watch to see what I'm saying is true. And one of the ones that Julie and I watch is for collector cars. We don't really have any collector cars and now anyway. We used to. Uh, when we lived in Texas, but you can see that the prices on virtually every kind of collector car is go are, they're going through the roof. Now you could say demographics and you could say low interest rates and both of those things would be true. But I think the larger thing that's going on are people are beginning to realize that there's going to be some inflationary pressures that are going to essentially make it so that their saved cash is worth less. So they want to put that money into hard assets. Every single uh, economic bear and Jim Rickards is my favorite one, New Case for Gold, another great book. But if you were to read his latest book, he was the most you know, doom and glooming. He thinks there's going to be some sort of dollar, you know, all kinds of different things, right? Very interesting, fascinating. The guy used to work for the CIA. He used to work for, you know, he's very, very well respected. And so his opinions are, um, you know, they should be well regarded. But one of the conclusions he came to at the end of this book that would make you think that basically we're all going to be trading, um, you know, what would be, what are the Indians used to trade? Beads. Beads, right. <laughs> that we all be shells. trading beads and shells, right? One of his conclusions was buy real estate. And there's another, if you go all the way back, there was a guy named Baron von Rothschild. And Baron von Rothschild, I don't even remember when this was. It was like 1700s or mm -hmm. something. His thing was when there's, uh, when there's blood on the streets, buy real estate. Now, that saying carries forward to essentially say when there's uh, essentially a financial stress, 
Obviously, you want to go to hard assets and real estate being one of the best ones. But in his time, when there's blood on the streets by real estate, he meant that literally. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, at least we're not you know having to deal with That's true. actual problems but, like but that. But it is a fact that you know the investors are your competitors because most of the time they're paying cash. Well, what was and it? in Phoenix, for example, 30% of recent sales You're were bought by- number three? Or yeah. point number four? No, okay. it's yeah. all in number three. Right. So, it's okay. So, okay. Here's, you told me something the other day about Bill Gates and somebody else that were buying land. To talk about that. Farmland. Right. I think he is the second uh, biggest owner of farmland in the entire country. And I saw a map and he owns land like literally everywhere in almost every single state. Right. And so people are wondering why that is. Well, it's because all assets, these right? all, hard assets. Yeah. Right. Okay. So the, your, your point number three is now point number four. Okay. Okay. Point number four, institutional Uh investors are gobbling up anything under $200,000 and almost always paying cash. In Phoenix, for example, fully 30% of recent sales have gone to investors. Either iBuyers or small investors, flippers are also buying in these price ranges. But that was, again, that's something that a lot of you have been dealing with. Uh, with institutional investors and everyone thought the institutional investors would sell the houses when the market was really hot but guess what they're absolutely positively keeping not them. selling the houses they're keeping the houses because they realize what an incredible guess what inflation hedge and investment mm-hmm. these houses are now the normal um you know the three rules the three reasons you buy investment property has been really there's two you buy it for cash flow and you buy it for depreciation on your taxes and appreciation is the you know the hopeful the benefit bonus. right the bonus that you can't expect but you can't expect cash flow if you buy well and you can't expect uh, to be able to depreciate on your taxes but the argument for appreciation or inflation has never been stronger in the 20 plus years Julie and I've been in real estate and this is something that everybody knows at this point. Um, and really, there's again, this is it's going to just do nothing but make the market even hotter. And because there's going to be more money mm-hmm. that's going to be rushing uh, to invest in real estate. And if you think it's been a furiously fast, you know, seller's market in the past really 24 months, just wait over the next 36 yeah. to 60 months. So you better be learning how to become a listing agent. Well, and remember, the reason we're going into this deep dive is so that you guys stop thinking that you're going to wake up tomorrow and it's just going to be easier. There is no real estate crash on the horizon. By yeah. the way, mm-hmm. in case you guys have yet to request your free coaching call, I believe we have 16 uh, free coaching sp- calls spots left this week. Just text the word education to 47372. Text the word education to 4732. I'm sorry. Text the word education to 47372. If you hear Julie and I are struggling a little bit, sounds like we have allergies. It's because here in Puerto Rico, we are under, what is it, Julie? A Saharan dust warning. A Saharan dust warning <laughs> from the Saharan <laughs> desert. So there's, uh, Julie showed me a map. There's literally this big, massive cloud of Saharan dust blowing over from Africa that's halfway over um, all of Puerto Rico. And it's, it's going to be- It's just parked here. It's just parked here, right. <laughs> yeah. So we are struggling definitely right. to keep our throats clear. That Strangely, is for sure. Strangely, our weather comes out of Africa. Yeah, yes. we've had these omnipresent headaches for the past two or three days. Yeah, our weather comes out of Africa. Isn't that funny? strange. When I didn't we, believe that the first time somebody told me that. When we lived in Ohio, we had to worry about was Alberta- Alberta Clippers. Alberta Clippers, <laughs> these horrible cold fronts that come down to Canada. But now that we're in Puerto Rico, see how- Saharan dust <laughs> Saharan clouds. dust clouds. Yes. Okay. So our next point is the coronavirus pandemic is a short-term component that's stacked upon the long-term trend that we've been talking about from our previous points. People want more space, more privacy, and now have the freedom to move markets. This is a whole demographic that probably would not have been moving if, but for the coronavirus pandemic. So that's another reason. It's, it's, a yeah. large, it's the largest migration trend since the Industrial Revolution, which a lot of people don't understand. <laughs> it's real. The, in the Industrial Revolution, people were moving from the countryside to the city centers in order to basically have uh, work. Now what's happening is people can have work and move back to the countryside, and that's what they're doing. There was a lot of people that were saying that it was just a temporary trend because of coronavirus, but it's not just a temporary trend because of coronavirus. It's a permanent trend that essentially has made um, – coronavirus made it uh, happen, really, and, and in such a way that businesses start realizing that they can have remote workers. And that's one of the reasons, frankly, that eXp Realty is going to continue to be, if you know, it's going to be the largest real estate brokerage in the world. I'd be shocked if that didn't happen because everywhere globally, people are wanting to essentially move outside of these city centers, not just because of fear of the coronavirus or maybe even social unrest or things of that nature. It's because they want a different quality of life. I didn't say better, right? I said different. They've lived in cities. They've had to essentially endure the high costs of cities 
in some cases, very high cost of cities. And now they're saying, you know what, if I can keep my high, you know, high paid job and I can move to some place like, you know, Murphy, North Carolina and live in the mountains, I'm definitely going to do that and move the heck out of maybe, for example, Atlanta. And that's what people are doing. And that trend is going to continue. And if you're not aware of that trend and if you're thinking that somehow the uh, like I was talking to someone in the Upper East Side of New York. Um, and he was, you know, his name's Greg, and he was kind of panicky about the values in the Upper East Side, and he asked our opinions. Do you think the trend of people moving back to the Upper East Side is going to, you know, you think that's going to reverse back to people returning opposed to moving out? And the answer is no, it's not going to reverse, not anytime soon. There's too many headwinds right now to people moving back to the cities, and the coronavirus took what have, probably would have happened as a result of, you know, essentially people being able to use broadband and work anywhere using like Starlink satellites and all the rest of it. Now, coronavirus made what would have naturally happened over the next maybe 10 or 15 years happen inside 18 months. I think normally or naturally there would have been a migration like happened in the past 18 months, but it would have taken over a decade for that yeah. to happen. So wake up to the opportunities that are available in this new changing market. And if you're not with EXP Realty, and you're looking for an EXP Realty sponsor, please do consider Julie and I. We'd love to be your sponsor. Just text me directly at 512-758-0206. 512-758-0206. Point number five. All right. Our next point, low interest rates continue to add fuel to the fire. Yes, rates probably will go up. But, you know, I was thinking when I wrote that, when we bought our first house, you know, it was at 7%. That was like a really big deal. Mm -hmm. And and everybody's saying, like our parents were saying, you know, back in the late 70s when we bought our houses, we had to pay 17 18%. And you guys have to jump on it. Well, now we have a whole new generation going, what do you mean 7%? It's not going to go to 7%. It's going to inch up and people will still be buying. Well, and furthermore, rates going up would probably... It, a little well, more. So what, mar what segment of the market will higher rates affect? It'll be, affect the lower end for sure. Yeah. So those of you guys working with first-time buyers and doing a lot of VA, FHA buyers... Super if, payment. If, it, sensitive. It, right. If the rates go up, those are the buyers that are going to not buy. But here's the other thing that's happened. The difference in rents versus pay house payments yes. across the country. It used to be that renting was cheaper than owning. Mm -hmm. And now in some cases, renting is actually more expensive than an equivalent payment because the landlords know you can't actually buy a house, so they raise oh, their rent. I'm positive of this because the only time we ever lose tenants is because they're buying a house. Right. It's not because they're moving to a different rental. And, you know, so but that's another thing that's happening that's never happened yeah. before in the 20 years Absolutely. we've been paying attention. You Absolutely. Know. Okay, point number six. Record rates of savings in the U.S. and a huge number of all cash transactions. Now, why does that matter? Remember, we're, we are reminding you that things are not just going to magically adjust in, in you know, inventory favor. A couple of reasons for that. One is that people have lots and lots of equity in their house, which means even if there's, you know, people coming off of forbearance, just because you miss a house payment does not equal a short sale or a foreclosure. You can still get out and walk away over, with money. Over a trillion dollars worth of equity in homes. And I, we, amazing. We, let's not talk about distress, Jules, because we've talked about uh, that's that in so what many. I'm, I'm saying don't even think about it. <laughs> go, go back to past yeah. podcasts and listen to the podcast we did on why there's not going to be a housing crash, because there is not going to be a housing crash. Yeah, but people have money. They're using it. They're paying cash for transactions. This all fuels the market. So why are we sharing all this and we didn't even I, I didn't even talk about you know no underlying subprime mortgage stuff because I think six or seven points is enough to convince them so stop <laughs> hoping speculating and wishing that the market will just shift magically to a balanced or buyer's market it's not happening anytime soon remove that remember I said first part of our podcast was a mindset issue so the next part, and we can, uh, I think you this have something in three minutes. Yeah, yeah. To, so let soon. me just give them a prequel. The next part is all about what to do and why you might be part of the problem. Because things we hear from agents are, I already have too many buyers, too much stress trying to win a bidding war. Why would I want more? And I'm afraid to take listings who also have to buy. We want to remove that thought process from your brains and help you do something about that. And uh, the third part of this is an actual script for them to use to both create inventory and handle that question. All right. So Julie and I are going to go have some hot tea. Yes. And we're going to wash the Saharan dust out of Love our it. throat. Honey. It is crazy, isn't it? Yeah. You feel the headache, don't you? Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't want to share my ills with other people, but <laughs> Saharan dust clouds, come on now. Well, of course. I <laughs> because why not? <laughs> I know. <laughs> anyway, if you guys need us for anything, please uh, text me directly at 512-758-0206. 512-758-0206. In the meantime, have a fantastic day. We'll talk to you on the show tomorrow. This program has been a presentation by Tim and Julie Harris, Real Estate Coaching. For more information on our real estate coaching and training programs, visit our website at timandjulieharris.com. 
Remember to tune in weekdays at noon for upcoming shows. And until next time, thank you for listening to Real Estate Coaching Radio with Tim and Julie Harris. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.